you in turn when it's their time to speak, and they will speak for eight minutes each. And then there will be an open question and answer session after that. Um, I expect and encourage you to engage in that lively, I hope, Q&A session that you will have after the main speakers. However, I do have to say that as some of you will know, a small number of people attending events like these um, have set out to prevent people from speaking. And while I recognise that the topic that we're here to discuss this evening is a highly charged subject for many, um, preventing an invited speaker from speaking does not reflect the traditions of the University of Edinburgh. by the protocol office, but I do believe it. <laughs> so, while I rec um, as a university community, we provide a platform for debate and critical discussion around sometimes difficult and contested issues, and we open that platform to people reflecting different viewpoints on these issues. So I will state clearly at the outset that I am not prepared to tolerate any behaviour intended to prevent anyone from speaking. And I will remind you all that the event is being recorded, both filmed and audio recorded. Having said that, and sorry to you know, be tough cop at the beginning there, I am looking forward to hearing more about an issue. It's not something I know very much about. And I'm looking forward to hearing from a range of different viewpoints. In the question and answer session, you may wish to challenge points made by our speakers, or indeed you might want to support them. Please do so. All I ask is that you do so in a manner which is respectful to others attending this event. If any of you need to leave the hall for any reason at all during the event and you want to come back in, then that's fine, but make sure you take the ID that you use to get in back out with you or you won't get back in. Okay? Finally, um, I want to say that I'm aware of at least one person participating in this event who's relying on the hearing loop induction system. The system works really well at normal sound volumes, but if, the, if there's a high noise level, it can cause distortion and in some cases physical pain. So please be mindful of that when you're making your contributions this evening. Okay, um, our first speaker, I have great pleasure in introducing you to <coughs> Professor Rosa Freeman. Uh, Rosa is a professor of law, conflict and global development at the University of Reading. Uh, Rosa researches on the United Nations and has a number of interests within that area, human rights bodies, creation and implementation of international human rights law, accountability for human rights abuses committed by UN actors, and the intersection between international law and international relations. So, Rosa, please read. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gail, and thank you to Shireen, wherever you are, for organising the event tonight and for inviting me to speak. Thank you to the University of Edinburgh for providing a platform for respectful, evidence-based discussion of a difficult societal challenge. Talking about difficult societal challenges and looking for solutions are at the heart of the purpose of universities. And it is heartening to see over the last year that more universities and more academics feel able to hold these types of events in the current climate. The subject of my talk is to frame the discussions tonight with a background on international human rights law and why we have specific rights for women. I'm a professor of law, and I specialize in international human rights law and the United Nations, and much of my work focuses on protecting vulnerable groups. Now, excuse me if this sounds a little bit like a lecture, I'm going to run you through an entire module of international human rights law <laughs> in about eight minutes. <laughs> international human rights law sprang from the ashes of Nazi Germany. Up until that point, under international law, a government could do anything it wanted to its own people without it being unlawful. That meant that what the Nazis did to German citizens, whether they were Jewish, gay, black, disabled, was lawful. What it did to citizens of other countries was unlawful in international law. Clearly, it was morally reprehensible to keep that international law system. And in 1948, in the ashes of Nazi Germany, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted to address that gap and to provide protection to the weak individual against the powerful state. When the Universal Declaration was being drafted, there was a discussion about whether to have specific protections for women as a particular class. Because women have always been subjugated, oppressed, and dominated in every society in the world. 
But it was decided that if we were going to have universal rights, that we all have by virtue of being born human, that to have a special category for one group would go against that ideal. And so the drafters, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who advocated for that position, decided just to have universal rights that we all have by virtue of being born human. However, even though countries signed up to this, although, let's be clear, it wasn't every country, it was only 50-odd countries, because most countries were under colonial rule, and even of those 50-odd countries, most of them, from the USSR and its allies, did not sign up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But even though most signed up to it, it very quickly became apparent that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was human rights for men and not for women. So, what happened quickly was that women self-organised, as we tend to do. And the women's <coughs> rights movement, the Commission on the Status of Women, did more in the next 20 years on human rights than the main UN human rights body did on the universal rights. In 1967, the Commission on Status of Women took the groundbreaking step of adopting a declaration on eliminating discrimination against women, followed in 1979 by the Convention, which is a treaty, a binding <coughs> international law document, on elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, and an accountability mechanism that some of you might have heard of, called CEDAW, which is monitors state party to the treaty as to how they're complying with their obligations, was created to review and implement that convention in states that signed up to it. The advancement of women's rights at the international <coughs> level has continued with further groundbreaking moments. But at the same time, we know that women's rights around the world are not protected. Women as a group, as a vulnerable group, remain subjugated, dominated and oppressed in every society in the world. But that fight for women to have specific protections paved the way for this idea that while we are all born with fundamental human rights by virtue of being born human, we might also have additional vulnerabilities by belonging to a vulnerable group. And so now we have treaties on children, on persons with disabilities, persons from racial minorities, and many others. There's one currently being developed on the rights of older persons. It is seen now that while we all have these fundamental rights, we also need additional protections for specific vulnerabilities, what some people might call intersectionality. In international human rights law, women have been defined as referring to biological sex. This has been the definition in various international human rights treaties and discussions, including recently in the Rome Statute, which created the International Criminal Court, where it made it explicit that the word gender refers to the two biological sex classes of male and female, and that is written into the treaty. Gender, on the other hand, has been described as social constructs based on the different ways that the two sexes are viewed and treated in societies, including laws and practices. So some forms of discrimination against women might be based on their sex. So if you deny a woman access to reproductive rights, that's based on her sex, that's based on her uterus, on her childbearing, uh, and so on, or child rights. Others may be based on gender constructs, such as denying girls the right to education because society views the two sexes differently and says that gender construct of being a girl means you don't need education or you might not be able to take advantage of education. The international human rights law framework and mechanisms provide specific protections to women to access their fundamental rights, taking into account the vulnerabilities based on sex and on gender constructs. Separately in international human rights law, there have been attempts to protect LGBT plus persons, what the UN calls SOGI, Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Minorities, and it's the word I use because I work at the UN. So if I keep saying SOGI, forgive me and I hope you'll all understand what I mean. Those attempts are frequently blocked at the UN by the 77 countries that still criminalise, discriminate against, oppress, condone violence, torture, and extrajudicial killings against SOGI minority. And many of the efforts at the UN level to protect those individuals have failed because 77 of 193 countries want to continue to do that with impunity. At the UK level, there is a somewhat checkered history in terms of transgender individuals and the law. On the one hand, transgender individuals, oh wow, two minutes. <laughs> On the one hand, transgender individuals have lived free from state violence. On the other hand, they've not been able to access their fundamental rights until the Human Rights Act, followed by the Gender Recognition Act of 2004, in terms of fundamental rights to a private and family life. I'm going to read through this, but I'm going to put this up on the internet if anyone wants to read it in full. <laughs> Essentially, in UK law, 
Called it and Corbett, the case of April Ashley, the famous transsexual who before the days of the internet everyone wanted to talk about because she married some sort of high society guy. It was trying, they were trying to decide whether she could have married a man given that she was born male or whether that marriage should be annulled. And the court said sex is based on biology. It's based on chromosomes and gonads and genitalia. The Gender Recognition Act looks at gender reassignment, which says you can change your legal sex but not your factual biological sex. The crux of this issue at the international level and at the UK level goes along the lines of this. Women have fundamental rights by virtue of being more human like every other person. Women also have rights set out in CEDAW by virtue of being born women. We need to be fighting to protect those and also fighting to advance SOGI rights so that people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, transgender or anything else have their specific vulnerabilities protected as well. We all need to be fighting for a world where we all have our human rights upheld. But just like we don't mix religion and disability and say that the two need to be conflated, so too we cannot mix sex and transgenderism and say that by conflating the two, we'll be protecting either properly. Okay, um, just before I introduce you to Claire, I forgot to say that if you want to tweet about this evening's event, then the hashtag to use is sex based rights ed, that's ed at the end, with sex and based and rights and ed all capitalised. Okay, sorry, you see, I forgot. Right, um, let me introduce you next to Claire Huken. Um, Claire is an award-winning writer who blogs under the name Sister Outrider. I had a look at her blog earlier today and was very impressed. I will be following it now. She writes on subjects including race, power, identity and sexual politics. And her work has been featured in several publications including 404 Inc's Nasty Women. Claire is author, also the co-author of the book What is Race? Claire, do you have your mic? <coughs> okay, on you go. The time is on. Okay. Um, I would like to begin by saying I'm nervous. I am not brave like Rosa. I don't take any kind of anti-feminist backlash in my stride. Before this event, uh, when I agreed to participate on this panel, ever since I have felt panic. And so I have decided to talk about the politics of that fear. Loosely speaking, it would be fair to say the last century has been defined by cycles of progress for women and then pushback against those gains. Universal suffrage, women entering public life during both world wars, that bit with the feminist backlash, with the anti-feminist backlash of the 1950s housewife and homemaker ideal. The feminist writer Susan Faludi has gone into, she wrote this amazing book called Backlash on this subject. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And she says, women's gains in formal education, political representation, etc., result in a persistent backlash to any action or talk or even acknowledgement of women's rights. And I think that's a bit of what's happening here. In contextualising resistance to talk of women's sex-based rights as part of that backlash, it doesn't really make it any easier to live through. Women rejecting the label of cis or shamed, women who advocate for a collective sex-based rights are stigmatised and even threatened. It's really scary, and it wouldn't be happening if our rights weren't at risk. Thinking about the politics of protest a lot in this last month, I've realised that as a black lesbian feminist, more often than not, I'm on the side of the protesters than the protested. This invited a spot of reflection. I believe that looking at your values and your beliefs is an essential part of feminist practice. Feminism is my first love. It's given me community, purpose, something to believe in and even to live for. Like many of the women sitting with me, women's liberation is basically my raison d'etre. That being said, I know what it is to be made marginal by white women. In feminist spaces, I have absorbed racist words and deeds. This has devastated me personally. 
It's also been really isolating, as other white women within those groups and spaces would often look the other way or go out of their way to pretend that there wasn't a problem so that nothing had to change. They would rather have held on to their racism and the power it brought them. It was more important to them than building a sisterhood across difference, a sisterhood with the power to dismantle patriarchy brick by brick, which is what we all want. This led me to question my place in the movement, at points asking whether being part of it was even viable in the long term. I have, at points, hated the racist white women, but I have never wished harm on them. No woman, under any circumstances, deserves to be punched, burned, killed, or threatened with violence. This is not, to my thinking, the language of resistance. It is the language of patriarchy. I'm not saying this to set myself up as some kind of paragon of feminist virtue, but you don't see lesbians suggesting that we throw punch straight women, disabled women sending images of guns to able women. You don't see women of colour carrying baseball bats at an anti-racist march because they want to be feminist. in conversations about sex and gender. I want to stress that it is a tiny minority of queer or trans-identifying people who are responsible for this. And as often as not, it's a bearded heterosexual white man advocating violence against women in the name of allyship. But still, that climate of fear has been built and maintained threat by violent threat. As some of you will know, I wrote a series of essays on sex, gender, and sexuality. In those essays, I reaffirmed same-sex attraction and asserted lesbians as female homosexuals. And when I shared it on Twitter, a male with a cutesy anime avatar responded, I hope you get raped. I think there was an LOL in there somewhere. No empathy for women or survivors. And as you will know, there's a long history of corrective rape being recognized against lesbians. It's still very prevalent in the global south as Britain exported rampant homophobia while colonizing half the world. This conversation has reached breaking point. Everybody involved has skin in the game. It's not fun and it fractures vital communities. I don't have all the answers, but we need to be finding areas of consensus, finding ways to peacefully and respectfully negotiate areas of competing interests. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Claire. Um, I have to say, you said you were nervous. You didn't come across nervous at all. That was great. Thank you very much for your contribution. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone on now to Louise. Dr. Louise Moody is a research associate in philosophy at the University of York. I googled Louise this morning and I found the title of her PhD thesis and I can't even pronounce it, let alone understand it. So we've agreed that I'm going to say that Louise is interested in perception, imagination, Consciousness and Epistemology. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak and all the hard work to that you put into making this event happen. So, um, I want to think about the concept of gender identity from a philosophical perspective and the reason I want to do this is that the concept of gender identity is presently an ill-defined and confused one with no legal place. <coughs> so, um, and I think that's rather startling given its appearance um, in the policies of influential organisations. So we have Stonewall, for example, who tell us that um, a person's innate sense um, of their own gender, whether male or female or something else, which may or may not correspond to their assigned sex at birth. So the basic idea being expressed by organisations such as Stonewall, Amnesty, and now the UK NHS, 
because I understand it, is that gender identity consists in, or as philosophers, you know, they use fancy words, they say metaphysically constituted by <laughs> someone strongly felt personal conception of themselves, as male, female, um, some combination of both, or perhaps neither. So, um, this conception of gender identity naturally raises some questions, and I want to consider just three today. And I want to emphasize that the aim is not just to raise objections, but to help us all arrive at a more robust and clear conception of gender identity that is compatible with and upholds women's sex-based rights. So, the first question I have is this, right? So if we suppose, if we run with this conception of gender identity that's now appearing in um, policies, um, has consisting in someone's strongly felt internal sense or experience of gender, then an immediate obvious question we have is this, that we need to say, by what non-arbitrary criteria can we distinguish gender identity from other cases in which someone also has a strongly felt sense of being something. That there are just compelling yes, reasons so that for that thinking that, of, of that they are not so to speak up. Yeah, yeah. speak up. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, okay. So, you know, you have um, in the literature, in uh, psychiatry and philosophy, you come across things um, which are called a family of misidentification syndromes. And we all know about the case of Rachel Dozer, the um, US white woman who claimed to be a black woman with a passion for um, African American rights. And there are even more research cases, right? You have people who actually report a strongly felt conception of things like being dead, or that they have, you know, multiple um, physical and psychological copies of themselves. And that's, you know, that, that's actually pretty absurd because in, trivially and intuitively we know that feeling that one is a different colour, being dead or magically duplicated, that's just not sufficient for making some of the case, right? That's just absurd. But we are told now that um, this subjective conviction about gender identity is increasingly said to be sufficient for making someone male, female, some blank birth or neither. So it strikes me that organisations or indeed anyone who um, wants to explain this concept of gender identity in terms of social strongly held feelings, I think we are owed a clearer definition of gender identity that avoids these kind of absurd equivocations. Is that something we want to get away from? And the second question I want to raise is this, right? There is, um, in the policies that are given, like the Stone and Amnesty and so on, there's the implicit assumption that someone cannot actually be mistaken about their gender identity. And that's actually quite puzzling because um, in philosophy and um, psychology it's fairly non-controversial to say that we are often very, very mistaken about the nature of our mental state. Or if we put it quite plainly, we can say why assume that someone cannot be mistaken about their gender identity when we are often mistaken about fairly basic things like beliefs, sensations, Beings, right? So, if um, an example that my friend was telling me last night, Julia, but that she said to you, right? Well, if we think of the phenomenon of referred pain, right? So you have pain in one part of the body that's often experienced elsewhere. And um, many years probably going to know of a case where someone's going to say they're experiencing like they've got two they called jaw pain, and then a few weeks later they have a heart attack, right? So in these cases, it's obvious we say. They, have, they are badly mistaken about both the source and location of their pain. And it seems perfectly intelligible that someone might also be mistaken about what their strongly felt feeling, called gender identity, objectively indicates. So it seems to me that this strongly felt feeling, it could spring from
from um, being the object of whispering, from internalization of, um, say, restrictive gender stereotypes and roles, more so than it does this sense of really being female or male. And we'd better have some way of establishing that's um, the case before someone goes in and embarks upon a medical pathway that there are consequences that are difficult to reverse, should that, you know, strongly felt feeling, in fact, be mistaken. So, it, so again, it strikes me that those who want to explain the um, concept of gender identity in terms of strongly held feelings as Stonewall and Amnesty and the like do, we are owed a clearer account of precisely what those feelings are, and in particular, why it is that we cannot be mistaken about them in the way we often are mistaken about many of our mental <coughs> states. And the last question I want to raise is this. Again, let's run with, you know, the conception um, of gender identity as consisting of someone strongly felt personal conception of themselves as being a um, certain sex. Then the question is, we need to know how it is that people are identifying as the same thing. So, you know, suppose, for example, we've got this room, right? Suppose there are 20 people in this room who are not correctly assigned their sex at birth, but they nevertheless have a deeply felt sense of being a woman. Then the question is, how do we know that all those people have the same sense of what it is to be a woman, right? We need to know whether these individuals are identifying as each other, whether they have the same feelings as someone who was correctly assigned their sex at birth, or whether they have, for want of a better word, an, an ideal in their head of what it is to be a woman, and perhaps are they identifying as that. So, in short, we need to know what it is that such individuals are comparing themselves Two, and we just don't have a grip on that <coughs> without a grip on that. The concept of gender identity is a very nebulous one that's just doing no explanatory work in informing um, the policies of various organisations. So in conclusion, I just want to say that we need serious clarification <coughs> on how some organisations and groups are now using this notion of gender identity if women as a sex class are not to disappear. Thank you. Thanks very much, Louise. Um, as uh, Sarah wrestles with the lapel mic, I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker. That's Professor Sarah Pedersen. Sarah is a professor of communication and media at Robert Gordon University. Um, Sarah's research has focused on communication through a variety of forms of media, including newspapers and electronic media such as scholarly journals and blogs, and covers both historical and modern cutting-edge technologies. Um, Sarah's recently published on Mothers Online on Mumsnet, blogging women during the First World War and the suffragettes. She was recently, congratulations, elected as fellow of the... She accused me of stalking her when I ran this introduction by another fan. So, she was recently elected as fellow of the Royal Historical Society in recognition of her contribution to historical scholarship, particularly in relation to the Scottish press and to the suffragette movement. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for everybody who's organised this event today. I want to talk to you about the concept of the bourgeois public sphere in reference to the debate about women's sex-based rights. The term bourgeois public sphere, as I'm sure you all know, was coined by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas in 1962. <laughs> he used it to describe a virtual or imaginary community where individuals came together to discuss society's problems and through that discussion, to influence political action. Thus, ordered and respectful public opinion became political action through participatory democracy. Such public debate, debate he argued, initially took place in coffee houses and the nascent mass media. These days, much of it takes place online. 
Now, Harbour Mouse's depiction of the public sphere was of an idyllic, inclusive place where all citizens <laughs> spoke equally, whatever their class or social status. All members of the public who participated in the public sphere could expect to have their voices heard and their arguments debated. Well, when I say members of the public, of course what I really mean is men. <laughs> and in particular, white, middle-class men. In the 1990s, feminist scholars such as Nancy Fraser problematised Habermas's concept of the public sphere, suggesting, suggesting that it was not equally open to all, but was instead dominated by powerful white middle-class men. Women, people of colour, those of low, lower social status were frequently excluded. Fraser suggested that women who were excluded from the wider public sphere instead formed what she termed subaltern counterpublics, which functioned as both a space of withdrawal and a training ground for agitational activities directed towards the public sphere. She identified, for example, the consciousness raging groups of the 1970s feminists as one type of subaltern counterpublic. Here, women labour to make the personal issues related to childcare, equal pay, domestic violence, political or public, through such devices. Fraser's criticisms of the idea of a public sphere, open to all, coincided with a growing disillusion of feminists about the supposed utopia of the internet. It was becoming clear that all were not equal online, and the prejudices formed in the offline world were being continued and even amplified online. So what does all this mean for us today? It is clear that the public sphere is still not an equal opportunity space. Social media such as Twitter may appear to have the potential to act as a public sphere where we can hold government to account and encourage diverse voices. However, certainly in terms of the debate about women's sex-based rights, social media has not acted as a space for public debate from all sides of the question, but has instead moved to close down the voices of gender-critical women either by denying them a platform whatsoever, by deleting Facebook pages or suspending Twitter accounts, or by encouraging self-censorship amongst women, concerned about what they say online, how it might uh, impact on their careers or their lives in the real world. I would argue that women have responded to the increasing exclusivity of the public sphere by forming new subaltern counter-publics. Now, much of my research over the last 10 years has focused on the parenting forum Mumsnet. For those who do not know Mumsnet, where have you been? <laughs> it was established in 2000 and is now the largest parenting website in the UK. It bills itself as a site for grown-ups, with limited moderation and a commitment to free speech. And its discussion topics ex uh, expand beyond traditional mothering subjects to include news, politics and feminism. The site has a particularly active community of users and has initiated and is involved in a number of campaigns on topics such as rape myths, better miscarriage care, the removal of sales reps from maternity wards, and the sexualisation of young girls. So far, so appropriate. However, Mumsnet has also become notorious or celebrated, choose the word you want, for allowing this discussion of gender critical feminist ideas on its feminism and women's rights boards. The boards attract activists and others who have been banned from other social media platforms, such as Twitter. Despite attempts to close down these discussions, <coughs> Mumsnet continues to carefully offer a public space, uh, possibly a subaltern counter-public sphere, for such discussion. In April 2018, the founder of Mumsnet, Justin Roberts, told the Times that thought police were pressurising advertisers to withdraw from the website with threats of a boycott of their products. Roberts stated that Mumsnet worked hard to keep discussions civil, but was determined to let them continue, and that the site was prepared to take any potential advertising hit. She also stated, and I quote, what's worrying to me is the thought police action around speech and the shutting down of the right to be able to disagree and immediately labeling it as transphobic. One reason why Mumsnet may be keen to continue this discussion is that it is both popular with Mumsnetters and attracts new users to the site. In July 2018, Mumsnet shared the information that there had been a 12-fold increase in the number of people entering the site directly via the feminist chat topic. In September, Mumsnet itself started a thread entitled Tell Us Why You Use Mumsnet. The thread received 
897 responses, I have counted them, <laughs> 574 of which directly reference the feminist chat threads as the reason users continue to return to the site. As one user put it, I came from the babies, I stayed for the feminism. <laughs> it therefore makes good sense, business sense, for Mumsnet to offer a place for gender critical <laughs> feminist discussion. It has become Mumsnet's USP, which so far means that such debate is valuable to Mumsnet, keeping users on the site and attracting new ones. It also demonstrates the fact that women will find places to discuss issues that impact them and their children, either in their own homes, in village halls, or in protected spaces online. But the women of Mumsnet do not just debate women's sex-based rights online. They have also initiated and become involved in real-life campaigns such as Man Friday, where women declare themselves to be male for the day in order to gain access to men-only spaces. Now, Fraser suggested that women who are excluded from the wider public sphere instead formed subaltern counter-publics, which functioned as both a space of withdrawal and a training ground for agitational activities. I would suggest that Mumsnet acts as such a space. Let me add a final remark. I have spent the last two years traveling around Scotland giving talks about the Scottish suffragettes and their suffragist sisters. I'm often asked at these talks whether I would have been a militant suffragette or a constitutional suffragist. I have always answered that I saw that myself very much as a suffragist, quietly writing letters and signing petitions, only dipping a toe in the public sphere of the day, and probably rather disapproving of the militant actions of the suffragettes. <laughs> By coming here today and speaking so publicly, I think I'm beginning to embrace my inner suffragette. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. And while Lucy gets mic'd up, I will introduce you to Lucy Hunter Blackburn, our fifth speaker this evening. Lucy is a poly policy analyst with Murray Blackburn Mackenzie, but she's also a currently an ESRC funded doctoral student at the University of Edinburgh, the School of Education, and she's the former head of higher education in the Scottish Government. Um, and Mac Murray Blackburn Mackenzie is a policy analysis collective which is based in Edinburgh. by making a comment about the lapel mic, which Caroline Criado Perez has rightly identified as a male default item. <laughs> <laughs> so I also want to say, and my thanks to those of other speakers, to Cherie, for having done so much uh, to make this event happen. So I work with Lisa and Kath, who were over there. Do you want to make yourselves known? Um, when I say work, we do all this, of course, entirely unpaid, un I said unpaid, uh, and in doing so, we're like so many other women at the moment. Um, we have between us backgrounds in making, analysing and communicating public policy, and over the last few months, we've come together to apply this to what we're calling the unregulated introduction of self-declared gender identity. That is, the way that public and third sector bodies have replaced sex with self-declared gender identity ahead of any change at all to the law. I'm going to draw on an article that we've written on this, which I'm really delighted to say is being published this summer and will be open access. And in writing that, we in turn were able to draw on the work done by other amazing women in Scotland who it's a privilege to work with and some of whom are in this audience. Our piece includes two detailed case studies, which are the censors and the prisons. And I'm just going to talk about prisons in the time I have. I want to start with a really important general point, which is here in Scotland, as in the rest of the UK, we lock up too many people. We lock up too many women and too many men, and our prison population is drawn heavily from our most disadvantaged communities, and everyone in prison is vulnerable. However, women who make up about 1 in 20 prisoners are well known to be particularly vulnerable. And this should not be a controversial point. In April 2012, the Scottish Government published the report of its Commission on Women Offenders, sometimes known as the Angelini Report. This emphasised that women in prison are much more likely than those in the general population to have serious mental health problems, and, this is a quote, women offenders themselves are often victims of severe and repeated physical and sexual abuse. 
Less than two years later, the Scottish Prison Service published its gender identity and gender reassignment policy. Now, it was right for the prison service to develop such a policy. By then, it was clear that transgender prisoners could be very vulnerable and had specific needs. The problem, emphatically, <coughs> is not with having a policy for this group, but with the way it was done, how it happened. Specifically, the failure to see the policy as having any possible impact on the female prison population and to assess that impact and to monitor it. The policy is founded on treating people according to their self-declared gender identity, whether or not they have a GRC. The accommodation chosen should therefore, in the policy's words, reflect the gender in which the person in custody is currently living. The policy emphasises, and the bit I'm going to read out when I say emphasise it, it is in bold in the original. A male to female person in custody, living permanently as a woman, without genital surgery, should be allocated to a female establishment. She should not be automatically regarded as posing a high sexual offence risk to other people in custody, and should not be subject to any automatic restrictions of her association with other people. The decisions, the decisions, it's important to say, they're still made case by case, and there's provision for risk assessment, and I will come back to that. However, this new policy was clearly intended to mean that some people, who had previously been held in the men's estate on the basis of their physical sex, would now be held in the women's estate. And as we'll see later, that was pretty much its central purpose. And yet, when the prison service came to do an equality impact assessment, it did not consider how it might affect the women in its care. An equality impact assessment invites an organisation to consider which of the nine legally protected characteristics under the Equality Act should be affect, might be affected by any policy. And in this case, the box for sex, which is misdescribed on the form as gender, as happens so often, was left blank. Nowhere does the free text section recognise women as a potentially affected group, and no women's groups were consulted. And in a list of evidence considered, quote unquote, relating to equality groups, the Angelini report, at that point not yet two years old, is not even mentioned. There was absolutely no recognition that the policy would have any effect on women in prison, none at all. Now there were two vulnerable groups of prisoners that this policy should have been particularly concerned with. One was prisoners with a transgender identity, and the other was women. The policy development process looked only at the first and completely ignored the rights of the second. How did we end up there? The policy document carries two logos, that of the Scottish Prison Service and the Scottish Trans Alliance. And when Susan Sinclair, an independent researcher who tweets as Scottish women, some of you will know, looked at the metadata for the policy document, she found the author was named as James Morton, the director of the Scottish Trans Alliance. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that James wrote it without any input from anyone else, but it underlines how this policy was the product of a very close partnership between the prison service and the STA. In a book published last year by James Morton, he commented, or published last year, in which he to which he contributed, James Morton commented, we strategized, I'll repeat that, we strategized that by working intensively with the Scottish Prison Service to support them to include trans women as women on a self-declaration basis within very challenging circumstances, we would be able to ensure that all other public services should be able to do likewise. James added, the learning from our prison work has made it much easier to assist other Scottish public services, such as NHS wards and schools. In other words, prisons, specifically women's prisons, were targeted as a place to establish a sort of policy bridgehead for self-declaration, from which it could be rolled out more generally. Not as a place cautiously to trial and assess it before taking it further, but just to get it in place before moving on to other providers. Now, however this policy had turned out in practice, that process would have been deeply flawed by ignoring the possible women's impacts on women. But, as this was a test case, it's reasonable, I think, to ask what happened. Well, we now know from work that was published last week by Women in Girls Scotland that despite the individual risk assessments in every case, this policy has had a negative impact on women in prison. The information comes from a senior, well-verified source in the prison service, a whistleblower, and why should it take a whistleblower to learn this, in effect? You can read the Women and Girls Scotland briefing for the detail, and you should, but a critical point the source makes is, not, is that this is not just about individual incidents of sexual and physical aggression that have happened, 
but about the psychological effect on women prisoners who are already traumatized, remember, by male violence, of having to share their day-to-day -day intimate accommodation with people who, for their appearance as well as their behavior, women can clearly recognize as male. Now, just as the SDA strategized, many other organizations have been persuaded to replace sex with self-declared identity, and as with prisons, this has happened without consultation with the women affected or their representatives, and no or at best desultory formal assessment of impacts on women or girls. And often these policies are grounded in assertions about the law that are simply wrong. <coughs> now in the longer piece we've written, Kath, Lisa and I argue that this is a clear example of the capture of the policy process by one set of interests to the exclusion of others. And as such, it represents a serious failure on the part of the public bodies concerned. It raises questions, of course, about the specific vulnerabilities of women's rights, but it also reveals a more general vulnerability of our institutions to single-minded, ideologically driven lobbying. And those who can't bring themselves to care about the rights of women might, I think, at least try to care about that. Thank you. Um, you were treated to a wee bit of Thunder Road there again because Lucy went over by five seconds, I think. <laughs> so, uh, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final speaker this evening. Um, just while you're getting mic'd up there, this is Julie Bindel. Julie is a writer and she's the co founder of the law reform group Justice for Women. Um, she's a radical feminist um, and the group Justice for Women has since 1991 been helping women who've been prosecuted for killing violent male partners. Julie writes regularly for The Guardian, The Sunday Telegraph magazine, The New Statesman, and Truth Day. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I'm really thrilled and delighted to be here and with all of you, and of course our esteemed speakers and tonight I just want to speak about the pandemic of male violence towards women and girls and the feminist resistance to it. Now I first became a feminist at the very end of 1979 and it always sounds much better that I was a feminist in the 70s <laughs> but I had about six weeks. <laughs> and it soon became apparent as if I needed any further evidence, having seen it growing up in the northeast of England in a very poor community where police didn't care about anything to do with women and girls. It didn't take long to learn that this is a global issue and of course once feminism became globalised, then stories from countries in the global south and elsewhere in the north came thick and fast. And once feminists started working together across nations, across corners of the globe, we realized that no city, village, town, country, region, nation in the world is free of the fear and reality of male violence. And I would argue that the only thing, the only one thing that unites females everywhere is the fear and reality of male violence. I would rather not be a woman. I'd rather just be a human being. I have absolutely no idea what it feels like to be a woman, but growing up as a girl, I understood what it feels like to be female and what it feels like to be one of the oppressed class. Unless we recognise that females are a sex class and that that means that males are the oppressor sex class, then we cannot possibly understand when we say male violence. What on earth does that mean? Because of course, as you know, men are violated, usually by other men, not always. All people are vulnerable to violence, but there's something very specific about male violence towards women and girls, which is why we are feminists. Now, we can be feminists because we are concerned about equal pay, about maternity leave, 
about all kinds of issues that affect only the females on this planet. <laughs> but as I say, they don't really bond us particularly. For example, I don't have children, and I've never wanted children. I'm a lesbian, so I can listen to women telling their stories about rubbish heterosexual relationships. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of stories. <laughs> But we don't have that in common. Now, I'm very privileged to be able to travel a lot with my work as a journalist and a campaigner. And when I go to countries where you would expect things to be far better for women, for example, Norway, um, Australia, you find the most abhorrent things happening to girls. Of course, you find indigenous women in Canada, one of the wokest nations on earth, where across Canada, so far, today, there are an estimated 4,000 missing women and girls, all from indigenous communities, mostly who were prostituted. Now, prostitution doesn't happen because there are some people on the planet, men, who need more sex than others, women. That's an absolute nonsense. Prostitution would be starved of oxygen if we didn't have patriarchy, if there was no such thing as male supremacy, if men weren't the oppressor class, because we wouldn't have a situation where one group of people thought it was okay to buy their way into the, the, the inside of another person's body for one-sided consensual, sexual uh, pleasure, you just wouldn't. So when I go to countries such as New Zealand, supposedly a great bastion of feminist campaigning and liberation for women, you find an endemic sex trade where women are bought and sold, trafficked, abused, pimped, raped. Of course, in England, I just hear horror stories the whole time. And I also hear resistance to it, and I'm a tiny part of that resistance. We hear about rapists like John Warboys, the black cab rapist. Did you hear about him? Where police said, don't go in a minicab, girls, when you've been drinking. Because, of course, alcohol is the new short skirt, isn't it? We're always blamed, we're violated, and then it's our fault. So John Warboys, who raped probably around three to 400 women, didn't choose women on the basis of their class their race, nothing really except for they were young and they'd been drinking and then he drugged them. And of course police said, a black cab driver wouldn't do this, it's mini cab drivers that are the risk. So we are constantly told, keep yourself safe. We all know and in country after country after country where I visit and talk to the police, they all say the same. Women get themselves raped, which you have to be fairly ambidextrous to do. <laughs> Women get themselves murdered. It wasn't just during the time of Peter Sutcliffe, the so-called Yorkshire Ripper, in the north of England, where there was a curfew on women rather than on men when we were in danger. This is as current as the last so-called serial rapist, where we know that we are most at risk in our own homes. Now around the world I have seen every single product from women and girls sold for the benefit of the rich and often for men. I've seen hair stolen from blonde 12 year old girls in Ukraine. I've seen wives bought in Ukraine by western men who want a subservient wife. I have seen women in Cambodia sat linked up to breast pumps so that their breast milk can be sold to gay men who want to use the services of surrogacy, so renting the inside of a woman's womb, because they decide that they have the right to have a child. And as I said, talking about male violence without a clear understanding of females as an oppressed sex class is meaningless. This is why we have to keep saying it. This is why we are a global feminist movement. And this is why we have to continue to talk about women as a sex class 
until we've got all of this sorted out. Thank you. Thank you. speakers. Um, we have the room booked until 7 o'clock, which gives us 30 minutes for questions and answers. I uh, want to hear from as many people as possible with as many different viewpoints as possible, so I will ask you to please keep your comments or your questions very brief. Okay, uh, we have a roving mic. When I'm doing lectures with students, I tend to throw it at them because it makes me happy. Uh, I'm not going to do that with you because you're all adults. Uh, so, um, what I'll do is I'm going to gather two or three questions together and then ask the panel to, to comment on them. So if you uh, have something you'd like to say, you'd like to contribute, uh, please indicate in the usual way. That means put your hand up. Okay, um, Letitia, would you mind taking the mic to people with that? Is that okay? It's, yeah, it should be on. That's yeah, it's on. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> right, it's Hi. Um, I just want to ask what the panel thinks um, about... In Scotland, we have had so-called uh, feminist organisations that um, allegedly represent us like in gender, um, Scottish Women's Aid, Scottish Rape Crisis, uh, completely uncritically adopting the idea that trans women are women and therefore um, they don't need to implement any of the exemptions all allowed to them under current law. And I just think that like, how on earth did this happen? Hearing about the prison, uh, the strategically um, uh, going for prisons and uh, the, the definitions used there, that's useful. But I, I just cannot wrap my head around why there's so little resistance from the organisations that are purporting to represent women in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Just, um, just get some, like, somebody else, just for the benefit of the panel, to repeat the question is, why has there been so little resistance um, from the organisations which are there to represent, uh, represent women? Okay, who's next? I also became a feminist in the 70s. <laughs> and looking around the room, it seems that a lot of other people did too. <laughs> um, but there are, you know, there's a nice mix here, but you know, everybody laughed, I'm guessing they agree broadly. Um, my perception is that this debate and this discussion that we're having in here um, is doesn't have the uh, participation of as many young people as I think it might have had had we been having this discussion in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, I might be wrong, though, but there are some people nodding. <coughs> I feel that we need to capture the enthusiasm and the imagination and the commitment of younger feminists or younger women who don't know that they need to be feminists. I'd be really interested in your views on how we can do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Patricia. Somebody down here would like to talk? Um, with the stripy shirt on, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, so excuse me if this is an obvious question to you. Sorry. Excuse me if this is an obvious question to you. Um, but I was just wondering. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of very in-depth discussion of uh, you know deep philosophical theory and uh, deep policy. But I was wondering if um, any of you would be willing to make more explicit what tangible harms uh, will come to women. Uh, if trans people and trans women in particular are allowed to transition and participate fully in public life as women. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So I'm going to take questions in groups of three. Thank you very much to people asking the questions for keeping them brief as we asked. I'm just going to repeat them briefly. Um, so why has there been less open, <coughs> as much opposition to this as we might have expected? How do we engage young people with this conversation? There are three of them up there from Leith Academy. Wave, ladies. <laughs> Um, and, and would the panel, does in the panel want to comment on, on what they think some of the more um, tangible risks to women might be um, from uh, trans women or women movement? I am going to pass this along, it's probably easiest, isn't it? Rosa, do you want to start us off? Oh. Thank you. To the, is it on? To the, to the question on um, sort of the Equality Act and, and why there's not been more resistance. I think a lot of us have been asleep, actually. Um, I think that 
we, we as feminists want to look after the most vulnerable minorities in, in our midst. Mm. And over the last 10 years, um, since the Equality Act, um, there's been a big conflation of sex and gender, or the removal of the word sex and changing it to gender, by organisations like Stonewall, the Trans Equality Legal Initiative, um, the, the organisations that you mentioned. Um, with a lot of pressure on NHS, on schools, other publicly funded bodies that have been absolutely slashed in terms of their money by the Tory government. And so they've offered free advice and taken out the word sex and replaced it with gender. And they've got the Equality Act wrong. And the law very clearly says that even if someone has a gender recognition certificate, they can be excluded from sex segregated uh, spaces where it is proportionate and legitimate to do so. And I think what we've seen over the last year more than a year for many of you in this room, but over the last year, it's women coming together and saying it's enough, and we want to go back to what the law actually says and make the law be implemented in practice. Um, the second question I'm not going to go to, but and the third question about the uh, tangible harms. For me, it's really important that we protect vulnerable groups with the needs of their specific, their specific vulnerable needs. Right, whether they're children, whether they're older persons, whether they're migrants, whether they're women, whether they're LGBT persons or SOGI persons. I don't believe that it's right for women or for religious minorities or migrants or LGBT persons or any other vulnerable group to conflate them all. I think we need a very serious and reasonable and frank conversation about how we can protect gender identity minorities, what gender identity means in law and how we can protect those minorities while also protecting sex segregated spaces and women's rights. And the only way to have those conversations is to sit in these rooms. And I can't answer it in five seconds, but I would really appreciate to be now talking with you at some point about this, because this isn't just a conversation at this level, it's a conversation going on at the global level. And I think everyone in this room, I would hope, firmly believes that what we don't want to do is oppress any minority. So we should be coming together as feminists and women. So you don't have to answer everyone that comes up. Can I just answer the second question about uh, young women? Okay, I wasn't a feminist in the 70s. I wasn't even a feminist in the early 80s. I admitted this afternoon I went to a Phil Collins concert. I wasn't a feminist because I didn't think it affected me. And I think, you know, I was young and I was stupid, okay? Um, actually, when I work with my students. My students are so much more clued up than I ever was at that age. Um, I, I asked a question at the beginning of my classes, do you identify as a feminist? Ten years ago, I had people looking everywhere but at the front. Not me, I'm not a feminist, because hell, I shave my legs. Now, I get three quarters of the class putting their hands up. So they are becoming more engaged. And I think social media is where they're becoming more engaged, and that's you know, that's one of the reasons we're, we're actually recording this. Hi, as the talking young feminist on the panel, I'm going to ask you too. Um, I think intergenerational feminist community is vital if women are ever going to achieve, achieve liberation collectively. But part of why um, we don't always have that intergenerational connection is a result of the ageist misogyny we're drip fed from a really young age. We're taught that older women are dull, older women don't have anything relevant to say to us. Where, like Beck phrased it beautifully at her talk with Fru Women in Scotland, she said that we've fallen into this pattern of reinventing the wheel rather than recognising the glorious treasure trove of information <coughs> that the second wave feminists left us. And I think the waves conceptualization, that is a bit of a problem because it divides us along quite clear-cut generational lines, whereas I think the most significant divisions in the feminist movement are all around belief, like the sex wars of the 80s and now what's happening with sex and gender. Um, I think we need to be having conversations across lines of belief rather than generation. Absolutely. <laughs> One thing, and I agree entirely with Claire here, it's an ideological difference, not a generational one, but young women who wish to be feminist and who instinctively know what feminism is rather than the kind of bearded, woke bloke version of feminism, are bullied, harangued, and extremely vulnerable to becoming 
total pariahs within their university women's groups, their working class communities, their friendship groups, their online groups. I have young women coming to me on a weekly basis, by email, by private message, whatever, who say that they are terrified to open their mouths, for example, about prostitution and pornography, because they're called whorephobes, and then of course they're called every single phobe under the sun. So they're bullied out of it, we need to stand with them and ensure that they can actually use their voices and, and make sure that we also recognise without patronising that we mentor young women who are in this vulnerable position. So with, with great care I tread into the area of the Scottish women's organisations and what, what say. I, I don't, you have to ask them how they have got to where they are and why. But that, again, is my answer. Not, I don't know how they got there, but I know what I think they should do. I think they should hold the meetings that they've cancelled. I think they should... Yeah. Yeah. They should use their extensive amounts of public money, particularly the organisations yeah. who are not service providers. They, I, I feel differently about those uh, dealing with violence against women's services. They're, their funding has a very urgent need for the people they deal with. But for Engender, which is an advocacy group, they need to be braver. They need to come and talk to people who disagree with them. It's doing them no favours, and it's doing this debate no favours. So that's, that's my comment there. Um, I also want to address the point about harms, because I think it's a really important point, and it comes up with prisons. And I think prisons is a really good example of how we could do this much better. So, for example, you, you might not know, but the majority of trans prisoners are held in fact, according to stats, according to their birth sex, and there's two reasons for that. Some of them don't ask for a move, and some of them um, are refused to move on risk assessment grounds. And the policy's not great for them at the moment, because it's all framed around them being moved. That's its predication. So what we need is a much better policy. Don't ask me what I think the policy should be, but I think we should talk deeply to the women who've been in prison. I don't want to assume there is no scope for moving any trans prisoners into the women's estate. Let's listen to the women who've been through it, and the people who've worked with them, all those people, about, about what they think. And let's think really hard about what we do with those trans prisoners who can't transfer, and there will always be some. Most of the female-born, the ones who identify as men, are held in the female estate, and the policy says in terms that um, they particularly are allowed to say, I'm a bit scared, I don't want to be in the male, male estate. We need to be nuanced, we need to be complex. The prison system is very binary. We need a whole different discussion. That policy is not a great starting point. Um, and I think that's how I want to come to every policy. We need to be pragmatic, we need to be thoughtful, we need to listen, we need to be contextualised. We need to keep in mind sex-based rights and sex-based issues. But on top of that, we could be so much cleverer, and I think public authorities have let down trans people really badly here, because I think they have been lazy, I think they have been cheapskate often, and they haven't given this the attention and the depth it deserved as an issue. That's one Uh, thanks. Uh, we've uh, got time for plenty more questions actually, we've got about another 20 minutes I think. So any more questions? And you can have the dice thrown at you, pass it to you, sorry, pass it to you. Um, and after that, I'll, yeah, I'll see you. <laughs> uh. Hi. <clears throat> so it seems clear that none of you uh, agree wholesale with uh, self-identification as a way of trans people getting uh, access to services that they might need, but it also seems clear that trans people might need some services um, in that way. Um, and it also seems to me that the system we have right now, which is the Gender Recognition Act and the Gender Recognition Certificate System, um, is unavailable to uh, trans people who are um, particularly oppressed if they've not got documentation because they've needed to work in uh, underground economies like um, like prostitution if they are um, poor so they can't afford the sort of time or the money that is required for that um, or even if they just like have unstable lives where they can't actually access that sort of documentation or money to, to go through the process is there a different way that you see that isn't just self-identification that could actually help people if, if they need that Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll bundle that up with another couple of questions if you pass the, the dice back. Thanks.
Uh, hi, it's not really a question, it's just a quick statement just to say to anybody that's here from the, the demonstration outside that I hope that you can see from the, the people that have spoken uh, in this panel tonight that there's no hatred at all coming from anybody in this room that are, are speaking on this issue and I really wish that people would stop trying to, to label us as fascists. You need to, you need to stop doing that, that's a really destructive thing to do. one more before we go back to the panel. So any other? Up to the top corner there in the green and black. I'll ask the panel to be reasonably brief in the responses as well because I know there's clearly people who want to ask questions and we'll try and get to everybody if we can. Hello, I'd like to ask um, what are three practical activities we can all go away with today, those of us that would like to advocate in our communities for the make the you know for female only or biological women only safe spaces, we'd like to protect those. What are three activities that we can all go away with and engage in to ensure that um, you know we we maintain access to female only spaces? Thank you. Great, thank you. And, um, model kind of question, very clear, very discreet, very brief. <laughs> well done. Like those. Okay, uh, so the questions panel are self identification. Does it, it seem to be problematic? Is there something else that we can do? Um, is it a good idea to keep the whole idea of gender anyway? And uh, three practical things that people can go away with. Who'd like to start? Could just use this one, I think, and then it goes up. Okay, I will start with the three practical activities. One, you can join for Women's Scotland. They have <laughs> members of the team all through the room. I'm sure they will come and speak to you. Two, speak to your friends, speak to your neighbours, speak to your community. Talk to them about how this issue affects you and other women. Third, there are also some MSPs in this room. Write to them as well. Take political action. Um, Scotland is pretty fantastic that way because you have representation at every level. There are multiple people you'll be able to contact and influence in that way. Participate in democracy. I'm just going to, to respond to the question about gender. I'm not gender critical, I'm a gender abolitionist. I think that's a question. <laughs> 
is based on sex stereotypes that are deeply harmful to women and girls, so I'd like to see the back of it. I'd like to respond to the question about um, self-ID, I think it was uh, up there. Um, I had this conversation with some of the protesters um, in January, some of whom are outside now from, I think they're called Edinburgh Sisters on Cuts. Okay, and, and we were having this conversation. I'm not a Tory, and I'm sorry if you are a Tory. I'm sorry for you, and I'm sorry for the country. No, 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 no. I'm, not, I'm not a Tory. Um, I believe that the reason we don't have properly funded services in this country is because we've slashed the funds. Now, there are people that would want gender services, and there are people that want gender segregated, and people who want sex segregated. And not every female necessarily wants sex segregated. It's our right under the Equality Act, but we don't have to want it, and some people will be comfortable with it. So let's take a lesson from, I wasn't a feminist in the 70s because I was born in 83, but my mum took me to Green Common. Let's take a lesson from the feminists in the 70s and the 80s. Those who want to keep funding the services we all need, whether we're women, females, or whether we are trans women, or whether we are minorities of any other type, let's self-organise until we get rid of this government. Yes. Let's fund proper services, some that are sex segregated, some that are gender segregated, that are not just adequate, but that are bloody good. And when we know that the government doesn't fund them, we self-organise. So instead of fighting one another, let's fight to have adequate and proper and accessible services that are appropriate for everyone. I really want to pick up on, on Rosa because I'm so glad you asked the question about what's the other debate we could be having about improving things. And one of the things that I thought was really disappointing about the consultation paper the Scottish Government put out was it, it laid out a series of issues. It didn't really develop, describe what the nature of the problems was and then it jumped straight to self-ID as the only answer to everything. And I'm, I'm with Rosa, we could be so much more creative about how we use our services and our spaces um, we could argue for funding, but above all we need to be talking, and it comes back to the question that very helpfully came from the front. We need to be talking in detail about specific contexts, specific issues, and specific problems. If we have long waiting times, and we have ridiculously long waiting times for mental health um, service access for young people um, under the CAM system, we have long waiting times um, for the, the Sandyford Clinic in Glasgow for gender identity services, we need to be asking how do we take people out of deep distress who are on these kind of waiting lists? And again, it's a funding point, it's a priorities point. So I think there's a conversation um, that is so much more productive, potentially, about how we address very specific issues and problems that people have, um, which would not be setting people against each other. The public sector equality duty is perhaps, at the moment, the most abandoned public duty on the statute book. Public sector equality duty requires public bodies to facilitate good relations between people with different protected characteristics. And all I see is public bodies doing the exact opposite. Yeah. I think that's, um, we've got time for a few more questions. Don't put your hands up. And whilst we're looking for questions, I should just apologise. As a chair, I'm supposed to be neutral. I find myself nodding in agreement when Rosa said we need to get rid of this government. I apologise for that lapse in my judgment. Um, okay, we have a question. Uh, hi there. Um, I really want to ask um, a question. What do we do about political parties? Because it seems to me that every political party, including the one that until recently I was a member of, seems to also be avoiding the question of women's rights. Uh, you know, I won't name a particular party, but one Scottish party. <laughs> and it's not the SNP, by the way. Um, basically saying, if you don't believe in all this and shut up, you, we don't want you in our party, so go away. Now, firstly, I would say that's a terrible way for a party to behave. But apart from the obvious things of writing to them, having meetings, how do we really get through that thing again? It's about the public bodies have just, you know, I, don't, I feel politically homeless apart from my feminism. Um, so how, how do you encourage party, political parties to, you know, not wear t-shirts that say P next to me or, or, you know, I just find that really unhelpful even though I do admire many of the people who are involved in these things. How do we stop a party from saying, if you don't buy into all of this, you're a transphobe and we don't want you, you can't be a member. So I just feel it's really very depressing. All the political parties are doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thanks. We've, got, uh, we've bundled up with another question. I think uh, there's one up at the back here. Um, I should say, as we're doing this, I'm aware that two of our panel members got a taxi booked for seven o'clock. So if you see them rushing out, it's not because you've upset them. Okay, they do have a taxi booked for a flight to back um, down south. Uh, thanks very much. My name's Andy Whiteman. I'm a member of the Scottish Parliament, and there are a few of us here uh, tonight. I just want to ask the panel a quick question to be answered in very general terms, of course, because it's quite detailed. The Section 9 of the Gender Recognition Act of 2004 says that when a full gender recognition certificate is issued to a person, the person's gender becomes, for all purposes, the acquired gender, so that if the required, acquired gender is the male gender, the person's sex becomes of the man, and the female gender, the person's sex becomes the woman. That's the law. I'm just wondering, do you think the law should stay that way? Do you think it should be repealed? Or do you think it should be reformed? Okay, thanks Andy. Uh, one more question down here, I think. So, yeah. And if you can start preparing your answers in the Google section line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll see the new section line. So wait till we hear this question. Um, I just wanted to raise, I think it's interesting that there's a group of people who always seem to be ignored and have been ignored tonight in the questions, which is trans men, young trans men. Yes. And yes. Um, <laughs> working in education, um, but, uh, because of my concern for the welfare of young trans men in education, further education, vocational education, that is one reason why it's very important that we have gen that we have gender identification being registered separately in the collection of statistics because at the moment we don't know where those those um, young men are and what their welfare is within education. So I wanted you some comments on why are young trans men uh, being ignored, uh, are ignored and, and what that means for the discussions of the Okay, thanks very much. So um we're going to bundle those three questions together. So there's a question about the political parties and what do we do about feeling that there isn't a political home for people. Um, section 9 something, Lucy knows about that. Um, and also the invisibility of young trans men, what do we got any observations to make on that? I'm actually going to start the last question, just one part of it, which is data. One of the things that Kath and Lisa and I have been very keen to argue for is a collection of data which doesn't <coughs> That isn't binary anymore. That actually says we have we have we can actually track where trans men are, trans women. I mean, we can, we've got everybody delineated and separated because everything is lumped in at the moment. And what's happening in things like stats for justice or anything else, education stats, we can't tell anymore what we're looking at. So we're very keen on gathering data both on sex and on identity, and then we really know stuff and we potentially are in a position to intervene and help people who need that help who we can't see. So. We'll be, um, so the GRA, it's very important, the Gender Recognition Act comes out of court cases and European law, and there's European law around this. Any legislation framework we have around this has to be within that framework. So I think there is no case, I, I wouldn't argue for a moment, for going back to where we are, where people have a capacity in certain <coughs> circumstances to change their birth certificate. The issue is not so much the GRA, it's about its interactions with things like the Equality Act, where people have got remarkably confused. The Equality Act is not an easy act. I've, I've spent ages, but most of my working life working with legislation. It's, it's a difficult read to work out what the drafters wanted, but we do know some basic things. So I think what's more important here is understanding, certainly before we legislate, anyone legislates, what does a GRC actually do in terms of changing your, say take prisons, does it change your rights of accommodation? Because although that's what Section 9 says, other parts of the GRA say that you can't become a priest. You know, other, there are things happen around sport and the Equality Act. There's lots and lots of law, which is an enormous but under Section 9. That Section 9 is not an absolute <coughs> definition. Um, and I think we need to get, there's a lot, too much confusion, which has not been helpful in this debate about what the relationship is between the Equality Act and the Gender Recognition Act. And before any legislation, before <coughs> the second of those goes forward, we need to understand the interaction of those two pieces of legislation. It's a mess at the moment. Okay, Lucy, we'll I'm going to stop you there because Julie and Rosie need Rosa, sorry, Rosie yeah. uh, need to leave. Um, so if you could show your appreciation.
Okay, that's great. Does anybody remember the questions? <laughs> Don't. Okay. All right. Sarah's taking them. Can I address the question about political parties? Um, because I know anybody who was on the internet in the couple of days before the European election was it was full of women going, I have no idea who to vote for, and people talking about holding their nose and, and trying to you know think about other issues. And I I know it is difficult. But I also think, and God, I sound like a suffragist here now, um, it is writing letters, it is signing petitions, it is coming to meetings, and I'm, I'm really, really grateful for the MSPs who have come here tonight. And it, it is going to meetings and asking them. <laughs> and, and maybe also it's joining the parties and making your voice known there. <laughs> Okay, um, folks, we have reached, I think, the end um, of the evening. We have two minutes to go. It just leaves me to say thank you to a number of people. First of all, of course, thanks to our wonderful speakers. Um, I, would, uh, I would like to thank you, the audience. I think this debate has been conducted in a very respectful way, and I thank you for that. I do this, but I would like to thank the senior management of the university, um, in particular uh, the Princeton and Vice Princeton Gavin Douglas, um, for having the courage to host this event. Yeah. Like to yeah. um, I want to thank um, James Broomfield and the security team for their. with the invitations and checking ID when we came in, the press office and the um, administrative team in the Institute of Education, Teaching and Leadership in the School of Education. There is um, one more person that we need to thank and that's the person without whom this event would not have happened and that's Shireen Benjamin. She has had, so I would like to uh, congratulate her on her, her vision for making this event come together, her courage in persisting with it, and her perseverance in making sure it happens. So, thank you.